Hello, and welcome to Real Estate Minutes with Shannon. Today, we're going to be reviewing landlord and tenant law, especially in the state of North Carolina. Let's get started. Your learning objectives for this unit are to dis describe the basic concepts and terminology of the relationship between the landlord and tenant, to list and define the non-freehold estates, and to list the essential provisions of the North Carolina Residential Real Estate Agreements Act and the North Carolina Tenant Security Deposit Act. You're also going to be able to list the types and characteristics of leases, the essential and common provision of leases, and the application of the statute of frauds to leases and the requirements for recording leases, as well as defining the rights of the parties to a lease. Let's get started. There are a few terms that you need to know. First, the landlord is called the lessor in landlord tenant law, the tenant, the lessee. The lease is the contract between the landlord and the tenant when which a party agrees for valuable consideration, in this case, the rent, to let another have occupancy and profit of the land for a definite period of time. A lease is a bilateral contract. Leasehold means that no transfer of title is going to occur between the landlord, the owner, and a new owner. The tenant is simply going to be allowed to use and possess the property, but won't have ownership rights. For the national portion of the exam, you also need to know privity of estate. These are the rights and duties that arise out of the property laws, like the exclusive right of possession under our bundle of rights. The privity of contract are the rights and duties that arise from the lease, the contract itself. For example, whether the landlord has the right to re-enter the property per the contract. Now, you do need to know the North Carolina Residential Rental Agreements Act for the uh, state portion of your exam. This is important that you understand the landlord's or lessor's duties and that the landlord is not allowed to waive any of these duties, even if they have an agreement with the tenant. So first things first, the Residential Rental Agreement Act says that the landlord must keep the unit in a fit and habitable manner. They have to comply with regional, local, state, and federal building codes, and they must make repairs on the heat, the air, or any appliances that are available in the unit. Now, in order to be able to call a unit fit and habitable, it does have to have heat. Air conditioning is not a requirement. However, if the lease is made at a time when air conditioning is present on the property, then the landlord does have to keep the air conditioner working as a term under the lease. Same thing with appliances. A landlord doesn't have to offer a refrigerator or a washer or a dryer, but if they do, then they have to keep that maintained and that working while under the terms of the lease. And in addition, the landlord has to comply with the law of negligence and keep the common areas safe. So common areas, the common law of negligence. The landlord is responsible for injuries that occur in the common areas if the landlord has failed to maintain safe conditions. So places like hallways, staircases, elevators, the playground, the community center that's in the middle of an apartment complex, any of those areas, the landlord is gonna be responsible for making sure to maintain safe conditions in those common areas. Now, if the injury occurs in an occupied area of the unit, the results are gonna be different. Generally, the landlord is not responsible. However, if the tenant has informed the landlord and let the landlord know that there's a problem and that something needs repair, then the landlord will be held responsible at that time. But under the common law of negligence, the landlord is responsible for the injuries that occur in the common areas. So the landlord is responsible for maintaining safe conditions in those common areas. All right, so we've talked about what the landlord is responsible for. Let's talk about the tenant's duties. The tenant is called the lessee and they're responsible for keeping the unit 
clean. So they're responsible for the disposal of their trash and the cleanliness of the unit. They also must keep the plumbing fixtures clean, meaning they should not be pouring things down the sink that shouldn't be there, including solids or grease and things of that nature. They should not be flushing things down the toilets, only toilet paper, never flushable wipes, never sanitary products, never anything that is used as a diaper, but they have to keep those plumbing fixtures clean. The landlord is responsible for making sure that each unit has a smoke detector and that they have fresh batteries when the tenant takes occupancy. However, the tenant is responsible for keeping the batteries in their smoke detectors fresh once they occupy the unit. And of course, the tenant will be responsible for any damage of the property or any act of waste. They must properly maintain the property once they take possession of it. So make sure that you know the North Carolina Residential Rental Agreements Act, tenant and landlord duties. Now we're gonna talk about four different types of eviction in this unit. There are two that are legal, one on behalf of the landlord and one on behalf of the tenant. This first one is not legal. It's called retaliatory eviction and the tenant is going to have a remedy or a solution if the landlord tries to retaliate and evict them for doing something like asserting their legal rights against a landlord. So let's say, for example, a landlord is not producing a fit and habitable unit and the tenant has asked repeatedly for the landlord to make repairs and they simply have not done their part. So the tenant has rights and the tenant is allowed to do things like complain to a governmental agency. They can request repairs. They can exercise their legal rights under the lease as well as under state and federal law. And they have the right to organize together. Retaliatory eviction comes when the landlord gets mad because the tenant has taken it to the next level that they've exercised their rights, their legal rights. And now someone on a higher level is looking at the landlord and holding them responsible. So the landlord can't then look at the tenant and say, I can't believe that you turned me in for that or that you asked the government to help you. I'm coming, I will make sure that all of this is taken care of, but I can't tolerate this, you're gonna need to move out. They cannot evict a tenant under retaliation. A tenant does have the right of a constructive eviction, however. If the tenant is living in a unit that is not fit, that is not habitable, then they ask the landlord to fix it and repair and the landlord repeatedly ignores them or does not do the job as it needs to be done, then the tenant does have the right under constructive eviction laws to cancel the remainder of their lease and vacate the premises if that landlord repeatedly fails to make the requested repairs. Now you wanna document this well. As a tenant, I would put in writing every single time I made a rent payment that there are repairs that need to be made and I would enumerate what those were. So constructive eviction deals with bad construction. It's an easy way to remember that. If the unit is no longer fit or habitable, the renter is allowed to vacate the property and stop paying the rent with no penalty for breach of contract. However, under constructive eviction, you have to physically move out. The renter cannot stay there and live there and simply withhold their rent. Now, North Carolina does have a Tenant Security Deposit Act, and you do need to know these rules for the state portion of your exam. The landlord or the property manager who is managing a property for a landlord does have duties in accordance with the Tenant Security Deposits. Number one is that all Tenant Security Deposits need to be returned to the tenant within 30 days of the end of the lease or of vacating the property. Unless, of course, there are damages, then the landlord has to provide a detailed list 
of the damages and the cost to repair those. And they can retain any part of that uh, deposit in order to be able to make those repairs. More on that in a moment. Now, the Tenant Security Deposit Act does have maximum deposits that can be requested by the landlord or agent, and that depends on how long the rental is for. If you're on a week-to-week -week rental, the maximum tenant security deposit is two weeks of rent. On a month-to-month, -month, the maximum is one and a half months deposit. If it's greater than a month-to-month, -month, the maximum is two months of tenant security deposit in rent. Now you might be wondering, well, what about our furry friends? I have a pet and the last time that I rented an apartment, they charged me a tenant security deposit plus they charged me a pet deposit. Well, pet deposits are okay too, as long as the sum of any pet deposit and the tenant security deposit does not exceed the maximum under the law. So for example, if you have a pet and the landlord is charging a tenant security deposit and a pet deposit, and you're on a 12 month lease, which is greater than a month to month lease, then the maximum that that landlord can request is two months of rent. Anything outside of that, they're gonna have to call it not a pet deposit, but a pet fee. Pet deposits can be refundable or non-refundable. It depends on whatever they write in the lease as a lease provision. And remember that service animals are always permitted free. They are not considered pets and no security deposit is required. Now, when is the landlord allowed to keep the security deposit? Well, there are certain situations in which it is allowed. And remember that the tenant security deposit is keeping that deposit safe so that it can be refunded to the tenant. However, we do get to keep it if the tenant has not been paying their rent, if they have damage that excludes normal wear and tear, things like if there's a worn carpet, if it needs to be repainted or recalked, that's normal wear and tear. But if there's actual physical damage, that is something that can be listed in detail and then get the quotes for what the repairs would be. And you can keep that portion of the security deposit as a landlord or an agent. The breach of the lease term also will allow permitted keeping of the security deposit, especially with the cost of re-renting if the unit has not been re-rented because of a broken lease and any unpaid bills. So when a tenant moves out, they should go through the process of having their utilities disconnected and making sure that they take care of any bills. However, there are some times in which they do not leave a forwarding address and therefore the unpaid bills come to you and therefore the tenant security deposit can be used in order to make sure that that is taken care of. All right, so the way that movies and TVs teach us about the landlord's ability to evict is unfortunately usually not the case. These we call self-help self -help evictions. So we're not allowed to kick someone out. We can't change the locks, we can't post a false legal notice on the door, and we cannot seize or destroy personal property for non-payment of rent. The only way to legally evict a tenant as a landlord is to go through a judicial process to take them to court. So it's called a summary ejectment. You file that through the district court and it's tried before a magistrate in small claims court. If you can prove that criminal activity has been performed by the tenant at the unit, then that can bring about an expedited ev eviction, but otherwise you're going to be waiting for the court process to take its time. So what's the process? The landlord files the complaint for the summary ejectment, and then the clerk of courts in the county in which the unit is located will complete a summons and assign a trial date. A copy of that summons is going to be sent to the sheriff's office, and a sheriff's deputy will be serving the tenant with seven business days to answer the complaint. The landlord is the plaintiff, the tenant is the defendant, and they go before a magistrate in small claims court in order to settle that claim.
All right, not included in the North Carolina Residential Rental Agreements Act is the Vacation Rentals Act. This is a separate act specifically designed for vacation rentals. And yes, it is okay if you are an owner of a vacation rental or an agent who is managing vacation rentals to collect security deposits from tenants, whether it be short term or long term. So security fees are collected by an owner for vacation security deposits, and that is allowed under the Vacation Rentals Act. And the tenant is entitled to a refund of that deposit if the property is unavailable. For example, a mandatory evacuation because a hurricane is coming through. It is available as a refund unless the tenants have been offered evacuation insurance to cover the risk and they declined it. So if they're given the opportunity to have evacuation insurance and they decline that, and there's a mandatory evacuation at the time that they have their rental scheduled, then unfortunately they will not get their refund of their tenant security deposit. Now, again, like all trust money, all security deposits must be deposited into a trust or escrow account within three banking days of receipt or of acceptance and entering into of the contract. As a landlord or as an agent for a landlord, you may charge a reservation and or a cancellation fee. And if you're in the position in which a new owner has purchased a property in which there are leases that are currently planned under the vacation rental rules, the new owner has to comply with those leases for the first six months of ownership. Now, the Vacation Rental Act is for stays less than 90 days. Again, the vacation lease must be in writing and the tenant has to have a permanent residence elsewhere. The rental must be for vacation and leisure use in order to fall under the act. Again, this is separate from the North Carolina Residential Rental Agreements Act, but just as important that you know that this act exists for benefit of the state portion of your exam. Again, any vacation rental property manager has to have a real estate license in order to be able to manage properties for another for compensation. There are four types of non-freehold estates. Back in chapter two, we learned about the freehold estates. Freehold means I own the property. Non-freehold means I can use and possess it, but I don't own it, I lease it. So the first two are the ones that we're gonna see most popular and in most use, but ultimately the first one is called the tenancy for years or tenancy for a definite period of time. Anytime you see tenancy for years, that is going to have a definite beginning and a definite ending or termination date. The lease will automatically terminate on that specific date. This is mostly used in residential rentals. And for example, if you have a tenant that signs a 12 month lease that starts on August the 1st and runs for the 12 months ending July 31st, that's a definite ending date. That is a tenancy for years, and that means that the lease ends on July 31st. That's when possession ends and the tenant needs to vacate. So if Chip gives his house to Dale for 15 years, Dale has a term of years. There's a definite beginning and a definite end date, 15 years, that's it. If Chip gives his house to Dale for five minutes, Dale has a term of years. So anytime that there is a specific start and stop time, that is gonna be a tenancy for years. On the other hand, a periodic tenancy is a, a state from period to period. There's a definite beginning, but the end is open. So it's an indefinite ending. And at the end of that period, it automatically renews until either party gives termination. So it's, for example, a month to month lease a week to week lease, a year to year lease. If it doesn't have a specific end date and it's indefinite in nature, it will automatically renew until either the landlord or the tenant specifically terminates. So if Donald conveys an apartment to Mickey for an indefinite period of time for periods of seven days, Mickey has a periodic tenancy. Each period is seven days and that would be a week to week periodic tenancy. If Donald conveys an apartment to Mickey for an indefinite period of time and they make an arrangement that the rent money 
must be paid to Donald on the first day of each month, then that period is presumed to be one month and the tenancy would then be a month to month periodic tenancy. If Donald conveys an apartment to Mickey from year to year, this is obviously a periodic tenancy, the periods for which are one year in length. Don't get that confused with a tenancy for years. The difference between a tenancy for years and a periodic tenancy is that the tenancy for years has a definite ending date. That is an automatic termination. And in a periodic tenancy, it has an open end date, indefinite ending, and therefore it automatically renews from period to period until the landlord or the tenant put in notice of termination. The next type of non-freehold estate that we're going to talk about is a tenancy at will. So if you've ever had someone tell you, sure, you can use my house at the beach for the weekend, that's not a problem. Have it, enjoy it, it's fine. That's usually a tenancy at will. What it means is either party at their will can terminate the lease and no notice is required. So feel free to use my property until either of us decide that it's time to terminate and you do not have to terminate with notice. So the landlord and the tenant can make a tenancy at will in which either one can leave the lease with no required notice and they can make it where there is rent or no rent collected. It's optional. The last one is not created intentionally. A tenancy at sufferance is at the end of a lease, the tenant doesn't leave. The landlord is suffering and therefore the only way to get the tenant to go is to go through the court process of summary ejection, eviction. So a tenancy at sufferance is where the tenant will not leave after his lease ends. It is not deliberately created. The tenant remains in the property without any right to do so and without the owner's consent. The only way to terminate is for the landlord to go through the formal eviction process called a summary ejectment. This is not considered trespassing, it is considered tenancy at sufferance. And the interesting thing is, is that this is a holdover tenant. They're holding over their lease, but they don't have any right to be there and they don't have any protection under a lease because it's been terminated. So no rents are collected during tenancy at sufferance. If the landlord were to receive rent from the tenant, then they're entering into another more formal either a tenancy for years or a periodic tenancy. So tenancy at sufferance, no rents are collected. All right, there are two different types of leases. We have a gross lease and a net lease. And the gross lease is going to have to do with mostly residential properties. And the net lease is going to have to deal with mostly commercial properties. And the primary classification is determined by which party pays the expenses. So think about it for a moment. If you were in a residential lease and you were leasing this house in the picture on the left-hand side, who would you expect to pay for the maintenance of the property? Something were to break or to go wrong, you would probably think, well, I'm gonna call the landlord and have them fix it. If the roof were to start to leak or the water heater were to go out, you would expect the landlord to pay. Same thing with paying the real property taxes or the homeowner's insurance on this property. They're gonna have a landlord's policy. You might have a renter's policy, but you choose to do that. So that would be the example of a gross lease. And a gross lease is one where the landlord pays for the maintenance and the operating expenses of the property. So the lessor landlord pays for the real property taxes, pays for the homeowner's insurance, and pays for the maintenance of the property. Again, most residential leases are gross leases. Now, when you have a situation where the tenant is responsible for paying for the expenses and the maintenance of the, of the property, you have a net lease. And most commercial leases are net leases. The lessee or tenant agrees to pay for some or all of the costs and expenses associated with the property, including those real estate taxes, including assessments, maintenance, insurance on the property, and paying for the utilities in addition to their rent. So some commercial brokers refer to these charges as TICAM, taxes, insurance, and common area maintenance. 
where the tenant pays for all or some of the operating expenses plus the rent, this is a net lease. You can also hear it referred to as a triple net lease. Triple meaning taxes one, insurance two, common area maintenance three. Triple net lease. Under the different types of lease agreements, you can enter into a specific type of lease. For example, the percentage lease. So if I have a retail space and I'm in a shopping mall or a strip mall or something of that nature, I might have a percentage lease. And that means that I have a fairly low fixed amount of rent that I pay every month. Plus I've entered into a lease that allows me to share a percentage of my gross sales with the landlord every single month. So in addition to that rent that I pay on a monthly basis, I will also give a percentage of my sales every single month to the landlord. Because when you're in retail sales spaces, there are some months in which you have bunker months. They're great, the sales are wonderful. And then other months where there aren't very many sales at all. So in order to be able to keep it fair and dynamic, you might enter into a percentage lease where you pay that rent per month plus a percentage of your sales to the landlord. In a graduated lease, the rental amount grows over time by a fixed amount that is agreed to and specified in the lease contract up front. In an index lease, your rental amount will change in proportion to changes in the consumer price index or other similar measurement. This is very common in office building rentals. In a ground lease, you have separate ownership of the land and the building where the land is leased, not owned. So for example, in the picture that you see here, the ground we're renting, and that's usually for a very long amount of time. A usual ground lease is about 99 years, and you can build to suit whatever you want on top of that land. So I own what's on top, but I do not own the land itself. A lot of times you will also find some kind of preemptive right listed in this lease that will allow the tenant to purchase this property should it become available sometime in the future. Because if the ground is leased and the building is owned, then you would probably want the opportunity to have the chance to stand in front to buy that land should it become available for sale. In a mineral lease, the mineral, mineral rights have been leased out and the lessee has the right to search for and mine for minerals during the lease period. All right, so in this exercise, we're simply going to match up each type of lease to its definition. So you'll see in the net lease, the tenant pays some or all of the operating expenses plus the rent. In a gross lease, used in most residential leases, the landlord is gonna pay for most of the operating expenses. In an index lease, the rent is based on an index like the consumer price index. In a percentage lease, that's used primarily in retail space. The tenant pays a percentage of his gross receipts to the landlord as part of the rent. In a graduated lease, that's a lease where there are systematic increases in rent that are agreed to upfront in the lease contract. The oil and mineral lease must be in writing and entitles the lessee to mineral rights in the property over the period of their contract. In a ground lease, you lease the vacant land for a long period of time. And finally, in a full service lease in multi-tenant commercial property, the leasees share the overall operating expenses. Now, common lease provisions say, in, a, in addition to those essential elements of every contract that we learned, CLAP, C-L-A-P, consideration, lawful objective, assent or mutual agreement of the parties, and legal capacity of the parties, you want to have in your lease certain provisions that will answer questions about things like the tenant's use of the property. What are the conditions for use? Are there environmental matters that need to be included in the lease provisions, especially for industrial leases? What about the fixtures? We learned about trade fixtures being personal property of the tenant, but are there specific provisions that need to be made about the fixtures?
What about who's going to be responsible for the repairs? In a residential lease, it's usually the landlord. In a non-residential lease, it's usually the tenant. But we need to make sure that that's specified. Also, in commercial properties, upfitting is important to be able to have in your lease provisions because you want to understand that most commercial spaces, you rent a shell. You have a floor, you have a ceiling, and you have walls around you, but there's a big empty space that needs to be upfitted. Whether you want to put in uh, office cubicles, whether you want to put in a break room and bathrooms, if you want to put in actual walls for different offices and conference rooms and things of that nature, there needs to be a provision in the contract about how upfitting is allowed, who will be responsible for it, if it needs to be approved, etc. You also need to have a conversation about subletting and assignments. So remember, in contract law, assignments say that the first tenant may be allowed to assign his lease provisions or his lease contract to someone else. However, in an assignment, you might or might not still be held liable for whomever has taken over the contract. So in this case, we need to know, is there or is there not going to be a release of liability in an assignment? Same thing with the sublease. Are we going to allow them? If the first tenant allows the second tenant to use part of his lease until he returns, that's a reversionary interest. But who's going to be held liable in the event that the second tenant breaches the contract, doesn't pay as agreed, etc. Also in the lease, you need to talk about default. What happens if there is a breach, non-payment of rent, for example? What is the term of the lease and is there a renewal clause? And where are those preemptive rights? Do we have an option? Do we have a right of first refusal? Do we have a first opportunity to purchase? Again, in that ground lease, do we give the right to purchase at the end of the lease to the tenant? And then we agree to a price in advance or a price formula in advance, or is that gonna be determined sometime in the future? There should be a lease provision about the landlord's right to enter during the lease term. Just because you own the place and you have a key does not give you the right to enter at any time. There should be rules around when the landlord has the right to enter the unit. Write it in. And then termination. When is this contract over? Does mutual agreement terminate it? What else would terminate it? Finally, we have the landlord's implied covenant of quiet enjoyment. Now, enjoyment is one of the things that we learned under the bundle of rights for real property. And enjoyment means that there are no third parties that would have an interest in the property. This saves the same that we learned in the bundle of rights. That landlord's implied covenant of quiet enjoyment says the landlord is going to provide a good, clean, non-defective title and provide the tenant with quiet enjoyment. So they have the continued possession of the property. The landlord has no right to enter the property unless the lease permits him to do so. And the owner is also paying against any liens that might be on the property like a mortgage. So that the tenants don't show up one day after paying their rent month after month to an eviction notice that says the mortgage is being foreclosed upon. Quiet enjoyment says we are not going to create any title defects that would hurt your ability to use and possess this property while your lease is in effect. Okay, what happens when you have an issue that should have been listed in the contract provisions but wasn't? Any issue that affects the lease provisions but is not specifically addressed in the lease contract is called a silent lease issue. And these are the things that you want to consider and think through and make sure that you add in specifics to that contract so that they don't arise. But there may be some things because people are creative. If a tenant wants to put a portable dishwasher in his apartment and the lease doesn't say that he can and the lease doesn't say that he can't, do we ask for permission? Do we ask for forgiveness? Ultimately, you want to make sure that you talk about these things and maybe have a provision that if something's not listed, what the process is for getting permission for those items.
or having a conversation about them. All right, so terminating a lease is very similar to the contract termination or discharge of a contract conversation that we had in contract law, where the parties can mutually agree to cancel or terminate the lease as the contract. Again, when the lease term expires, that will automatically terminate a contract and operation of law will also terminate a lease contract. When you have something like condemnation under eminent domain, the law says, we're taking the property, the lease can't continue, and so therefore we have to terminate. It wasn't my choice, it wasn't your choice, but the operation of law said it has to happen. And again, material breach of the contract where one of the parties does not hold up the promises that they made is going to terminate the lease. Lastly, I do need you to remember that death of a landlord does not terminate a lease. It will stay in the estate. It will go forward and be charged on his heirs, successors, or assigns. So death of a landlord does not terminate a lease. Let me say it again for testing purposes. The death of a landlord does not terminate a lease. Now, just one more word under condemnation, under eminent domain. Again, this can cause a lease to terminate, but there are two situations that might happen. Total condemnation, where the government takes the entire property, or partial condemnation, where the government takes only a portion. Obviously, under total condemnation, if that terminates a lease, then your tenant, the lessee, is going to be entitled to compensation from the lessor, the landlord for the remaining value of their interest in that lease. The partial condemnation says, well, the whole property isn't being condemned. We're only going to take a portion of it for eminent domain. And so that gives your tenant the opportunity to choose. Do they want to terminate the rest of the lease and get that compensation like we talked about earlier? Or do we want them to have the option to continue to possess on the remainder of the premises, but at a reduced rent because they're not going to have as much as they thought that they were going to get in the original lease terms? Now, remember, there are only two ways that we can legally evict. The judicial eviction, which is the summary ejectment on behalf of the landlord, if the lessee tenant fails to adhere to the conditions of the lease, the lessor can obtain the possession of the premises, but they have to go through the court actions. If you have on the flip side, a tenant who does not have a unit that is in fit and habitable manner, and they've made the request to the landlord to get it fixed, they can institute the constructive eviction. And that is where the lessee tenant is entitled to vacate the premises, terminating their lease, stop paying rent, and ultimately sue for damages. Now, the statute of fraud, as we have reviewed before, does remind us that any lease that exceeds three years in length must be in writing and must be recorded on public record to be considered valid and enforceable. Now again, most residential leases are not written for three years or more, but a lot of commercial leases are. Every lease that exceeds three years in its length must be in writing and recorded in public record to be considered valid and enforceable. So let's make sure that you have learned what you are required to learn in landlord and tenant law. You should, now that we have completed this lesson, be able to describe the basic concepts and terminology of the relationship between the landlord and the tenant. You should list and define the non-freehold estates. There are four. Also list the essential provisions of both the North Carolina Residential Rental Agreements Act and the North Carolina Tenant Security Deposit Act and describe the laws that protect residential tenants and residential eviction laws and procedures. You should be able to list the types and characteristics of leases, including the essential and common provisions of leases and describe the application of the statute of frauds and the requirements for recording leases. In addition, you should be able to define the rights of the parties 
to a lease agreement or contracts. I hope that you've enjoyed this lesson. Thank you for being here with me and I'll see you next time.